Okay, welcome back to 41, guys. We've got another homework answer key. I hope these are helping. I've gotten some good feedback, and um, you know, hopefully these are kind of helping you think through problems as opposed to just copying the right answer down. The idea is to use these homeworks, use these quizzes to really find out what you're you're confused about and, and clarify that confusion before the big points on the exam that's coming up pretty soon. Um, so anyway, let's go ahead and dive right in. This first one's really hard, right? Uh, chirality is difficult for many of you, and I totally understand that. So I'm going to try to talk about it a little bit differently today than I did in class because I've got some tools that I can use on my computer here um, that might make things a little bit uh, easier to see. And, and really what you have to do is look at this and think about it in three dimensions, right? So if it's chiral, right, what does chiral mean? That means you can draw a mirror image and you cannot superimpose it no matter how you flip it or rotate it it cannot be superimposed and that's that's really kinda hard to do initially unless you kinda look at these maybe build some models or you know go to the computer lab and, and draw it in Spartan and that's what I'm gonna do right now because I think I can show you in a little bit more detail before we jump to the the molecular modeling though I wanna show you just to remember there's one two three four chloros and there's two isothiocyanatos in the cis configuration here, 90 degrees apart. So remember that because that's what I'm going to try to draw for you in the molecular software, uh, modeling software. So let's see if I can bring one up. Okay, so here you can see my attempt to kind of roughly model this, this complex. I got one, two, three, four chloros. One, two, three, four green spheres will be my uh, chloros. And then to save a little bit of time, I'm not going to draw the whole structure for isothiocyanato. I'm just going to represent it by a red sphere. And you can see the orientation is identical to the way it's drawn in the complex. One little note, this is kind of uh, annoying. I hate when I make mistakes, but I, I am you know definitely going to fess up to them and, and tell you I'm sorry when I do make them. If this thing is a 3 plus and all six of these ligands are negatives, that makes that chromium a 9 plus, which is really not going to be very plausible. In fact, I just don't think that would happen at all. So if you were confused about how this could be a 9 plus, good for you because that was clearly a typo. I meant to to use a different metal and some different ligands. I think I was just really sleep deprived. You know how it is when you stay up late and you're trying to get something done. You make a goofy mistake here and there, and I apologize, but it will not affect the problem right now. So again, the main thing, four chloros, green, two isothiocyanatos, red. Okay, so now what we need to do is make a mirror image of this. And if I did it right, boom, we've got the mirror image. So here's my mirror. Here's the original complex, here's the mirror image, and in order for it to be chiral, we, can, we cannot superimpose this mirror image onto itself. So that means the opposite is true, that if we can superimpose it, it is not chiral, and that's called achiral. If so if we, if we can find a way, and if you look at this, right, I bet you if we rotate just a little bit, boom. I only rotated by about, what, 180 degrees, and I would argue that those are now superimposable. So if they're superimposable, they cannot be chiral, just cannot be. Um, the other kind of quick and dirty rule, if you wanna rule something out, and I don't have time to go through it in this video, but if you can find a ligand that is trans to itself, it cannot be chiral right away, and that can save you a lot of time on an exam. So anyway, um, I hope you can see here where, I'll do it one more time, here were our mirror images, and if I just simply rotate it around, right, and then I think I've proven to you that if I were able to move this over to here, they would superimpose, which means if the mirror images are superimposable, it cannot be chiral, and that's really important. So I hope that uh, clears up some of the confusion on chirality. And again, I said if you if you get a model kit, you can build these and prove it to yourself, um, or just go to the, the Spartan lab upstairs and you can do it for yourself. Okay, so let's keep moving along. So I think we we realize here that the um, you know the if we write it down we say the mirror image of the complex is superimposable, right? So if it is superimposable, it is not repeat, not chiral. And more specifically, we say that's achiral, right? Achiral means not chiral. There we go. Okay, um, now we're going to draw some structures. And I like drawing structures. I think it's really fun. So this first one, it says 
draw an ionization isomer. Where remember, ionization means you're going to take one of the ligands that's bound to the metal, and typically you're going to take a counter ion and you're going to swap them. And so that's really simple. We can say, okay, well we've got the chromium here. Um, you know, I'm going to go ahead and cheat and just draw it like this because I like to try to draw as few wedges and dashes as I have to. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Same thing, don't worry about it. If you like to draw the more wedges, then there you go. It's your world. I just teach in it. So here we go. We've got, I'm going to go ahead and swap out a bromo for that chloro, and that chloro becomes a chloride. So it's going to sit out there with its buddies, its new friends there. We still have the same geometry. Don't go changing the geometry on me. Um, you know, keep the, the octahedron intact. And then, of course, now we have our NCS, our, uh, like the TV show, uh, isothiocyanato. Uh, there we go. And then again, don't forget to put a charge on that. That's really important. Now, be careful. This is really important. When you're drawing your, your ligands, make sure the bond that you draw, you know, if you draw the metal, don't, don't do garbage like this. That, that's just lazy because you're not telling me what's actually bound. There are no lone pairs on the carbon, so it can't bond like that. Your only choices are that and that. And if you want to, you can underline it to make sure I know. But be, you know, take some time and give a, you know, give a care about what you're doing and, and show me that you're actually thinking about the lone pair that's bound and, and, and do it right. Okay, next one says draw a structural isomer. Well, a structural isomer is what? That's a different connectivity, right? And so in that case, that probably hints at the fact that you're talking about uh, the different ways ligands can bind, and that's really important. So here we can say, okay, well, I'm gonna put my chloro back on there. So the chloros go back. And in this case, I don't change where they are in space, I change how they're bound. So, um, you know, one of them was bound or both of them rather were bound through the nitrogen. So if I want a structural isomer, I can take one or both and I could swap it. So now it's bound instead of isothiocyanato, it can be just thiocyanato. I've not changed the, they're, nine, they're still nine degrees apart. I did not change that. I only changed how the ligand is bound. Remember, structural talk to, talks about the constitution. It's a constitutional isomer. How is it bound? How is its skeleton put together? And that's based upon what things are bound to what, and that's really important. We'll still put the charge on there, right? We'll say that, and then we've got three times bromide. And the last one is even simpler. You just say, okay, well, over here we need a stereoisomer, and that deals with how things are arranged in space, and we'll put our chromium there, one, two, three, four. Again, octahedral arrangement. Now I'm gonna put my chloros like this. Now up above, it was written or drawn in the cis configuration, so I need to make sure I'm doing a trans configuration here. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put my N CS bound through the nitrogen, and I need this to be 180 degrees apart, not 90, because 90 was the way it was. Now here's again where I'm talking about. Show me what's bound to the metal. Make sure you draw it so I can clearly tell and give you the credit you deserve. So in this case, now we have these as 180 degrees, which is our trans configuration, right? That is trans. Cis and trans are stereoisomers, um, and that's really important. So here we have that, and then I think we have our three uh, bromos, if you will. There we go. And then finally, the last question on the front first page here is, is your answer for four right here a diastereomer or enantiomer? We already determined it's not chiral, so you can't have any enantiomers because the mirror images are superimposable, so it's a diastereomer. It is basically um, the arrangement where we've gone from cis and trans. So that's a geometric isomer. I'm sorry, yeah, stereoisomer, um, sorry, diastereomer. So there we go. I think that's pretty easy to understand. So go back and look at that that handout if you uh, were a little bit confused. So um, I hope that clarif clarifies a lot and especially with the chirality thing you might want to go back and look at the, the models that I drew because um, I think that can really illustrate it maybe in a better way than I was able to do in class without a model kit. All right, uh, move on to the next page. Next page deals with um, crystal field theory, right? And so here we are given two complexes. You're given hexachloro cobalt 3 plus so I'm going to go ahead and mark that as uh, cobalt 3 plus. And then you have hexacyano cobalt 
three plus right there and out oh, look you caught me I made a mistake these are anionic right so we would actually name this as hexachlorocobaltate three right because remember anions you add the ATE ending to the metal name there you go so this would be hexacyanocobaltate three right so again anions you add the ATE really easy and then over here it says okay both of these complexes get dissolved in water one makes a blue solution, the other, the other gives you an orange solution. Draw the crystal field diagram. And here's where some of you were not careful. Make sure to follow directions. Label all the d orbitals. Give me the delta and give me the number of electrons. And so here, if we've got uh, cobalt as a three plus, if you do your electron configuration, you're gonna see that that becomes a 3D, um, that is a 3D6 if you look on the periodic table. So we have six electrons, right? And we're going to draw this first one. Now, if you think about it, the only thing that differs here are the ligands. And if you remember carefully from the notes, halides or chloroligands um, are going to give you typically a really, really small splitting uh, gap. Whereas things like cyano on the far end of the spectrochemical series on the right give you a pretty big gap. Um, and that's actually backed up by experimental data. And so when I draw this first one, I'm going to go ahead and just draw my two up top, and I'm going to draw that as z squared and x squared minus y squared. And I'm going to make my gap pretty small. And that gap comes from an octahedral, so I'm going to call it del O. And I'm going to put my three down here. I don't know why that line disappears. Uh, we're going to get my xy, we're going to get my xz, and we're going to get my yz. Really simple. And then I got six electrons. Now, if this delta is really small, we could go one, two, three, and since it's small, you'd rather jump that small gap than to pair up energy and get a penalty there from the repulsion. Uh, so I'm gonna go boom, boom, boom. So there's six, and I would be left with one, two, three, I'm gonna say four unpaired electrons. Okay, really important. Now if I come over here to the cyano complex, the cyanoligand, that's, that's, that's going to give me a big gap. So I'm going to go ahead and draw my two up here. Z squared and X squared minus Y squared. And I'm going to give myself a bigger Delo. Again, it's still an octahedron. And I'm going to bring my other guys down here. I'm going to have the same three. XY, XZ, and YZ. And now I've still got my six electrons right, and that's really important. So I'm going to go one, two, three. But now that gap is, it's just too much of an energy penalty, too much. I can't get up there. So I'm gonna go ahead and just pair these up and suffer that small energy penalty. And boom, and up here now I've got zero unpaired electrons. Okay, so now we need to think about that color question. It says, okay, is this complex the blue one or the orange one? Well, I'm gonna say that this gap is really small compared to this one over here. So what I might do is say, okay, this big gap, well, a big gap is high energy. What's a high energy color? Is blue a high energy color or is orange? And you'd be right to say that this compound over here is gonna absorb blue. And if it absorbs blue, it's going to appear, what color? Yep, you're right, orange. There you go, so this would be the orange complex. And then over here, if you've got a small gap, you're going to absorb the smaller energy color. So you will absorb orange and you will appear blue or reflect blue or transmit blue. But please, 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 I don't want anybody in this class to say that blue light or orange light is being emitted. These are not glow in the dark. There, is no, there are no photons shooting out of this complex. If you turn the lights off, you can't see it. It's dark, right? So there's no glowing involved here. This is simply taking, you know, for the example here, we could draw our color wheel if that makes you feel better, right? And you could go, okay, I've got my Roy G Biv, right? And so if I am absorbing this big gap, I'm taking this big chunk out of the spectrum of my white light, right? If I remove this big chunk because I'm absorbing it, then what I see that bounces off this compound or is transmitted through a solution of it is gonna be rich in orange, and that's why it appears orange. So, pretty simple. 
The last one is, we've already answered it. One is determined to be paramagnetic, one's diamagnetic. Remember that paramagnetic means at least, again, all it takes is one. You just need one unpaired electron to be paramagnetic. Diamagnetic, diamagnetic means you have no unpaired electrons. So if we go back up here and we look at this diagram, we have four unpaired, so this will be our para. We have zero here, this will be our dia. And I think most of you got this right. So uh, it looks like many of you are working hard. I've seen an increase in the uh, homework grades. And I really appreciate that. And I hope these, these videos are helping. Um, if you have more questions, you can come to the Friday review session during lunch. Uh, we'll have some pizza, some laughs. It'll be a good time. And then next week, we really want to bear down and, and get after it, right? And, and clarify any confusion and get you ready to do as well as you can on that first exam. So. Um, I'll have more availability in my office as best I can. Come see me. Uh, let's get questions answered and, and really get you confident. All right. Um, see you in class.